Well, Liara, thank you so much for being part of this conversation series. The future is calling us to greatness. I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time. Well, thank you for having me on. So I'm only recently familiar with your book on the vegetarian myth. Um, I first encountered you through Deep Green Resistance. And I'd love for you just at the beginning, in case folks who are watching or listening to this series are not familiar with you and your work, um, and this is not the place to be bashful, help us get who you are. Like, what are you most committed to? What are you most passionate about? What are you best known for? What you're most proud of? That sort of thing. Like, help, and, and feel free to take five minutes or longer. I mean, help us, help us really understand who you are. So I'm someone who has always been very impassioned about social justice and injustice, um, even from a very young age. And uh, I became a feminist when I was very young. I remember being seven years old and walking around the playground and asking all the other girls, are you into women's lib? Do you believe in women's lib? And that was what we called it back then. Uh, my mother is a feminist. She went to consciousness raising in 1972 and explained the world to us. I mean, I, it was completely obvious to me what she was talking about. Um, even at such a young age. I remember her explaining to my sister and I what was wrong with beauty pageants, um, which had a great punchline. You know, she got herself completely worked up, and at the end of it, she said, no one asks men to parade around on stage showing off their penises. <laughs> and we were like, oh, oh my God. But you know, it made absolute sense. Yes, exactly. Um, and we also, um, you know, she explained to us why we couldn't have war toys. My brother wanted a machine gun, and she told him no. And the Vietnam War was raging, and she was very against the war. And she explained to us what war was and why this was not a game. Yeah. And I understood that. I didn't. This wasn't something that I struggled with in my soul. I could see that war was a horrible thing, and that no, it was not a game. And I wanted it to end. So my parents went to anti-war demonstrations, and um, you know, were engaged in that way. So I feel like I absorbed a lot of really great stuff just from being born into the family that I was. And I, I really appreciate that from my parents. That's great. And great. my mother also read us a lot of really great books out loud. And it's so important to read to children. Oh, I know. I, I mean, this, I know this sounds like a total offshoot, but it's not. At this point in the culture, everyone is so addicted to their screens. And these children will never develop in, in inner life. There's, it's nothing but distraction constantly, exterior. And they will, they will never be able to reach deep inside and have those experiences of you know the poetry and music and that wellspring of creativity and deep philosophical thought and connection to themselves and ultimately the cosmos all of that's being destroyed Preach it, and sister. i got you're, you're so much of that <laughs> yeah no i got so much of that from being read to yeah. you know and you get a mythic structure i mean my mother read us some fabulous books we got narnia and the lord of the rings and it was all about you know are you going to be the person who steps up yeah to the plate and sacrifices if sacrifice must happen, but are you going to do what's right yeah. even if it looks like there's no hope? You still have to fight because fighting is the right thing if there's injustice happening. So I learned all of that when I was a kid, and I feel like I just took it and ran with it. So that was all, you know, that's sort of who I am and where I came from. And so as part of that journey, when I was 16, well, I became Hang on just a second. But before you go any further, I just want to honor your parents because that's kick-ass. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's no, really... They're, they're, <laughs> they're very good people. That's they're good. Very, and there's more I could say. I mean, my dad's a refugee. He came from Eastern Europe. His um, family was... They had to flee when the Soviet Union um, took over. They, you know, was invaded by... They, they're from Latvia, from the Baltic nations. So he had a very, very hard... I mean, I don't even know what words to use. Gruesome, grim just wretched childhood living in refugee camps and just, you know, watching people get killed, losing his whole family, all of this kind of stuff. And still through that, people, there are still good people in the world. And it, I don't know how people survive those experiences. I, I feel like such a privileged person. I've always had food, you know, and I've never watched my family get killed. I've never had to identify bodies in the street. I mean, there's just some experiences that they're, so completely different than any of us have ever had. I, I don't even know what the word healing means when you've, when that's been your childhood. But, you know, people do it. So I, there's, there's some kind of, there's something still about the human spirit that I think comes through. So anyway, all of that was also part of, you know, his, his resistance to the war and his resistance to, um, you know, the sort of the power structures that made these things possible. And, and he's still, you know, he's, you know, my parents are elderly now, but they still are the people they've always been, and they didn't lose 
track of what was important, you know, and all of that. So did he? Yeah, it's. I'm, I'm curious. Did he? Did we he, all have his. Did, did he take on the name Keith, or did you take that on? <laughs> that's no, that's not my original last name. I changed my name when I was 18. Oh, I see. For various oh, reasons, we don't need to get yeah, into. No, that's why. Anyway, just... yeah. Um, so um, anyway, uh, so all of this leads me to when I was 16. Um, I, you know, still had a very voracious curiosity about the world, about why things were such a mess. I, you know, I had been set on that path early. I read a lot of really great feminist stuff at that point that I found, and I also became a vegan. So I met a young, another teenage girl whose family, they were vegans, and all of that made, it was the only information I had, it made sense. You know, she starts to explain factory farming, I can see this is horrible, and I start to absorb all that, and so I decided that this was the thing to do. And so, you know, I grew up in an urban environment and I really had no idea that that was not necessarily the best thing to do. It was the only option I saw, yeah. you know, at that point. Yeah. Um, so I did it for 20 years and long story short was I destroyed my health on the vegan diet, um, as many people have. And there's this just tremendous moral collapse, you know, that you endure when the thing that you thought was the best thing possible yeah. stops working. Yeah. You can't figure out why. You know, ideologically, this was supposed to be unassailable, and yet I ended it up with a degenerative de disease, an autoimmune disease. You know, like on and on with the health problems, um, which you know half of which cleared up the moment I started eating a more appropriate human diet. Um, so clearly, it didn't work. But why? Why didn't it work? It was supposed to work. So now I'm set on this journey of trying to explain to myself and to others why this was not the best thing to do and ultimately I wrote my book The Vegetarian Myth so what this meant was absorbing a whole bunch of other information information that I had access to that whole time mm -hmm. but you know the problem with I think you know when you're very impassioned the, these things can become fundamentalist you know you can end up with a very rigidified sort of ideology even though you know you're being inspired by the best possible values and I read once a, a Buddhist saying that you know, even a correct belief, if held on to strongly enough, will become an incorrect belief, yeah. and that to me sound, sound, summed up you know my my life as a vegan. So all this alternate inf information, larger information, was out there, and I had engaged with it to some extent, but I couldn't really, you know, absorb it all because it was in conflict with my vegan belief system. Sure. And what I'm getting at here is the fact that agriculture is the most destructive thing that people have done to the planet. planet. It's the primary wound. And that's the problem. And the moment that people take up agriculture, they're on drawdown because it's, um, it, it's an inherently destructive activity that you know, blows through the entire biological community. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. you, know, you take a piece of land, you clear every living thing off it, and I mean down to the bacteria, and then you plan it to human use. So it's biotic cleansing. I mean, we talk about ethnic cleansing, but agriculture is biotic cleansing. So that's the end, right, of the whole world. And that's what happened. The planet has been skinned alive. I mean, we've had 10,000 years and we've trashed the planet. And as a vegan, I couldn't face that because that was supposed to be the good, nonviolent, peaceful, you know, food that was loving the animals. And it's not. It's destroyed 98% of the old growth forests and 99% of the prairies. And there's basically no topsoil left. So that's what agriculture's done. Um, so this was a terrible conflict with this idea I had, you know, that eating grains and beans was going to save the world. None of that turned out to be true. Mm. So I had to reinvestigate everything I thought I knew, and that is a very difficult process emotionally, spiritually. I mean, you're sort of left in the rubble. You're like, well, now who am I? If this didn't work, what does it mean about all these things I believed? And it was a terrible couple of years. Um, and I ended up, so then accumulating more information, you know, you read everything you can, you talk to everybody you can, you look at it, your own life. I mean, I had tried to garden as a vegan. It was a complete disaster. Um, you know, just even on the basic level of what do you do with the slugs? And there's this whole story in my book about, you know, trying to rescue the slugs, which everybody remembers that story because it's so funny, but this is what you're up against when, you know, you, you think that your life is possible without death and it's not. And that was the thing I had to face. And it was so hard. It was so hard. So anyway, I ended up writing this book because I, I got bored having the same conversation. But, you know, on a bigger level, I also wanted idealistic young people. I was speaking to my own self at 16 to say, these values are exactly right. You know, anything that questions human hubris, you know, anything that is about compassion or sustainability or trying to reintegrate human beings into that web of life, you're on the right track. 
Okay, but this is just a way station. You know that you need more information to make a better decision, and you need to understand that agriculture is this inherently destructive process, and the human race is going to have to face up to this because we are up against the wall right now. Yeah. Um, this yeah. is not a living pattern that has a future. I mean, it was from the very beginning. You know, the, the end was written into it. You know, we were going to hit the wall eventually, and we have now hit that wall. We're eating fossil fuel. You know, there's no soil left. Yeah. So I wanted all the young and idealistic, impassioned you know, radically leading young people to have better information. Um, and that's really what I wanted. The people who care the most, I want them to understand the scale of the problem. And that's ultimately why I wrote that book. And I went on yeah. to write Deep Green Resistance and other things, but that to me is the core of this, is, is trying to get people to understand the scale of the problem because most people don't, not in this country anyway. You know, we've got, uh, there's too many reasons for, for us not to understand it because we're the ones who are benefiting from it, you know. I mean, we live behind a military barricade so that we don't have to see, you know, the effects of this way of life. Um, so, you know, I want people to understand that. I want them to understand the damage, um, especially people who claim to want that knowledge. And I, I think they do. I think they really do understand that we're in a bad spot right now. We're really, we're at the cliff. We've got one generation left to fix this. So I, I want that to be introduced into the scale, into the, the conversation that, you know, people of conscience are having. So what is the actual damage? Where did it start? What is it made of? What are the, these activities that are literally the destruction of the planet? And that really is agriculture. That's the beginning of it. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, so that's where, that's, I guess, in a nutshell, kind of what, what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, no, I got it. I mean, it, it's interesting because my closest male friend, he's been my he's dearest male friend for the last 25 years, actually close to 30 years now, um, he was a vegan for a number of years, vegetarian for a number of years after that, and now he eats a primal diet, and he's been healthier and um, more fit, and it's just amazing. But I've not been exposed to um, sort of the thinking that you're now offering. Mm -hmm. So when somebody would say, well, if they get what you're saying, and they say, well, what's next? Like, where, where do you see a healthy future for humanity in terms of how do we relate to food? Okay. So the number one thing we have to do also, is... Uh, I'm sorry. Could you adjust your screen just a little bit? I'm looking sort of at the ceiling. There you go. That's better. That's, that's, that's better. Okay, cool. Okay. So the main thing that we are going to have to do, and quickly, is repair what's been destroyed. Especially what we have to repair are the grasslands, the prairies. Um, and these have been destroyed by agriculture. So, so you're talking the like reason permaculture, that, or how, how do we build the soil? Yeah, well, if we let the grasses come home, they will do it for us. That's their job. That is literally what they do to survive is build topsoil. Um, and grasses are really good at that, way better than trees. I don't have anything against trees. I love trees. I live surrounded by redwoods. Um, but the prairie grasses are the ones that are going to sequester that carbon. Um, global warming actually started when people took up agriculture. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because, you, you know, you clear all the grasses off the prairie, you've got bare soil, and now you're introducing lots of oxygen into that soil you know, every time you plow. And all the, the, um, the microorganisms that keep soil alive, that are the living soil, will then burn through the organic matter. And what that means is they're releasing carbon, essentially. I mean, that's ultimately, at the end of the day, what's happening. So if you look at graphs of carbon, I mean, we all know the little hockey stick, so you know, the beginning of the industrial age. Wow, look at all that carbon. If you back that up 10,000 years, the same amount of carbon has been released from the beginning of agriculture to the beginning of industrialization as has been released since industrialization to now. Now, industrialization was absolutely an accelerant on this process, but it was not the beginning of this process, okay? Agriculture is the original extraction. Yeah, now we're extracting fossil fuel, but originally we were extracting fossil soil. And all of that got burned up and put into the atmosphere. The only way we're gonna get it back down is to let the grasses come back and do that. Um, the good news is that this could actually be done. if. Uh, we had even 15 years, um, we could restore maybe 80% of the world's trashed out grasslands. Um, that 15 years of grasses, they, those grasses could in fact sequester most of the carbon that's been released since the beginning of the industrial age. That's an extraordinary thing, but that's what grass does. It builds soil. You know, it's interesting. We're just now, Connie and I, my wife, Connie Barlow, is a science mm -hmm. writer, and we've been traveling sure. North America for the last 12 years, speaking in churches and colleges and universities. Basically, where science, inspiration, and sustainability intersect is our passion. Mm -hmm. And we're listening to a book on audio right now called The, the Soil Will Save Us. 
Mm -hmm. And it's saying some of the same things that you're, you're saying. Yep. It's like, wow, I just hadn't thought about it. I mean, I've been saying for quite some time that to religious people, I'm saying that, you know, the second coming of Christ, mythically speaking, isn't some supernatural superhero coming down on the clouds. It's treating the soil as sacred. And when we yes. treat the soil as sacred, we will be saviors of the future and Christ will have returned in all his glory. I mean, to use mythic language. Um, but... Do you do you see? Uh, I mean, I see that the potential, the likelihood, actually, of there being less than two billion people a uh, hundred years from now, just from drought and famine. Uh, do you see that kind of a diet? Like, how do you see when you look out a hundred or two hundred years, assuming we survive climate change, which is not a given? Um, right. Wh what do you see a healthy relationship to food and the soil being? I mean, is it hunter gatherers or like what? What do you see as the future? So human beings and, you know, the, our genus Homo lived on this, this planet for two and a half million years. And for the vast a majority of that time, we were not monsters and destroyers. We were participants like every other creature. And what that means is there's intact biomes, intact biological communities. We take our nourishment from inside those communities. And in the taking of that nourishment, we actually make life stronger. We make the web of life more resilient and more lush and denser with life. This is what every other species does. So, you know, just to walk people through this, let's take the salmon as an example. I live here in Northern California. The salmon should be here. Okay, there should be 10 million salmon. There are 10,000. That's the level of reduction, okay? I mean, they're on the brink. Um, but what happens is the salmon, uh, it's a great nutrient pump. You know, they come up from the ocean. They bring all these nutrients with them in their bodies. Literally, that's what their bodies are. are vitamin pills for the forest essentially. They come up the streams, up the rivers, and what happens? The apex predators eat them. So you have bears, you have eagles, you have foxes. All these creatures feed on the salmon. What they do is they disperse those resources. They disperse those nutrients into the forest. Okay, so in the process of being eaten, I mean, oh, those evil bears, they're so mean, they're eating the fish, they're killing the fish. Well, in the process of eating, they distribute those resources into the forest. Now the forest is fed. Because the forest is fed, it means that the rivers are healthy. So those deep roots of the plants, of the trees, they are the ones that keep the soil from washing into those rivers and destroying the rivers. It's the first thing that happens in agriculture is the rivers are destroyed because there's nothing holding the soil in place. The trees also keep the rivers shaded so that the temperature doesn't get too hot. The moment you remove that cover, most of the fish are gone because the water is simply too hot for them. Um, so because the salmon give their lives to the apex predators who distribute the resources, who make the trees healthy, now the river is healthy, now the salmon have a home called the river. So in the process of being eaten, the salmon in fact make their home better for everybody, including themselves. And this is the cycle of life. And if you take just the bears and say, oh, they're so mean for eating the salmon, you're not seeing the bigger picture, which is that in being eaten, they are making the world better for themselves and everyone else. This is true for every single living creature. Okay? It's not, you know, evil apex predators against the poor prey. It's all of us. It's all of us. And it's the same. We we have the same role to play as the bears. You know, there are salmon people and you know their way of life is dependent on the salmon. And if you participate as humble, you know, supplicants to this process, you take what's needed for you and yours, but you're very careful about that because you know if you if you take too much, it's all over and everyone will starve, including the bears, including the forest, including the fish, and life is dust. Um, but if you do that in a humble way and you realize that you know you are dependent on this vast web of relationships and you enter that as the humble supplicant, this could go on forever. I mean, the Talawa lived on this land for 12,000 years, maybe longer, who knows, but at least that long and didn't hurt it. I mean. They had an actual sustainable relationship with the land by being humble participants. They didn't destroy it. I mean, when the first Europeans got here, the place was paradise. I mean, just by every account, it was amazing. Every 15 minutes, if you sat by a river, every 15 minutes, you would see a grizzly bear. And this should really, it's, it should be an incredible moment of mourning to say this out loud because the California grizzly bears are extinct. They're gone in less than 200 years. They're on the flag of California still, but they're gone. There's not a single one left. So that's what you know the European settlers did by dominating rather than participating. So all of this repair has to happen. Um, and it means especially those grasslands, that really what, was what we should be focusing on. And that means bringing back the appropriate ruminants. Without ruminants, the grasslands turn to desert. Uh, 
and the appropriate ruminants for the Great Plains are the bison. I mean, there's only maybe 1,600 purebred bison left at this point. Most of them are at Yellowstone, and they are under assault every single year. What's happening to the bison is just is horrifying. You could sit on a rock for four days and watch the herd thunder by 200 years ago. That's how many bison there were, maybe 60 million. Um, and that's plenty of food for people. But they need to be restored to that land, and the grasses need to be restored to them, and th they need to all make that home together. Um, if we simply got out of the way, that would happen naturally. Um, we could make it happen a lot faster. Yeah. And there are certainly yeah. ways that that could happen. I mean, it's right now all of the subsidies in the United States are going to completely the wrong things. I mean, even setting aside the military, which is just one great big subsidy, um, all of the subsidies now go to the most destructive foods that have ever existed, and that's wheat and corn and soy, you know, which can't be done without destroying those biotic communities. Um, it should be going instead to restoring the prairie and making bison, bringing the bison back. There are some wonderful plans. If you've ever read about the buffalo commons, I would highly recommend reading up on that. This is a plan to turn most of the Midwest into exactly that, a home for the bison once more. Yeah, I just and read, that would revive. Go ahead. I just read John Michael Greer's latest post was on uh, the buffalo wind, and he was talking about exactly that. Yeah, and it, I just um, heard Mike Meese speak uh, two nights ago. He is the um, leader of the Buffalo Field Campaign. They protect the bison at Yellowstone every year. He does amazing work. But he was talking about how some of the indigenous people who are buffalo people who depend on the buffalo, their word for buffalo literally translates everything. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And that is the relationship we should have to our food. Right to these incredible creatures that feed us, they are everything. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. So you... that is the relationship that we need to have again: is repairing, restoring, and then rejoining, rejoining as participants in those biotic communities, rather than as these destroyers that impose ourselves across the land. It's not a plan with the future anyway. I mean, we were bound to run out of soil, and now we're running out of water. They're using oil drilling equipment now to get water out of the Oglala Aquifer because there's no water left. That's what agriculture does. It drops the water table. You know, it's all gone. Um, so we're going to have to face these facts if we have any hope of heading toward true sustainability while keeping civic order and, you know, basic human rights in place. Otherwise, we're looking at, you know, these just horrible failed state scenarios that we're already seeing around the world of, you know, ethnic and religious and tribal strife and, you know, misogyny and genocide and, you know, all the horrors that, you know, face us on the news every day. And certainly people are, you know, doing their best to survive, but it doesn't have to get that bad. We, we could take control of this, you know, if, if people would face the depth of the problem, the scale of the problem, and actually look at the solutions then to those problems. I don't think it's too late. I think this could be done. Um, but, you know, it means we we really have to kind of reinvent the way that we are looking at this because right now it's I don't see the environmental movement doing that, and it is a great source of grief for me because I don't understand why we can't just face the facts. We're not going to get where we need to go unless we face those facts. Yeah. I understand the level of grief that's involved in this. I mean, you know, scientists are debating whether it's a quarter, a third, or half of all mammals going extinct by the year 2050. You know, to think of a world without elephants, to think of a world without giraffes or giant cats. I mean, amphibians as a, as a, you know, as a concept are maybe extinct by then. all of them. You know, there's already parts of China where there's, there are no more flowering plants and it's because all the pollinators have been driven extinct. Like that's 500 million years of evolution. Yeah. That's simply over. So there's a level of grief here. I understand people's reluctance to face this, but we've got to take our hearts out of cold storage because until we face the scale of the problem, we're never going to come up with the solutions that match, that, that scale up to that, to meet that problem. Yeah. Amen. Well, yeah. I, I, take your hearts out of cold storage. I love that. Cold storage, I, love that. Mm -hmm. I heard that. Um, okay. If somebody really gets what you're saying yeah, and like they take, saying, it they take it into their heart and says like, okay, how can I help so further like, moving in the right direction? Help. What would you advise? Sure. What would you suggest? Moving in the right direction. What would you advise? What would you suggest? So there's definitely policy changes that have to happen now <laughs> to make all this happen. Um, so the first question for anybody is, like, what are your gifts? What are your talents? What's your passion? What is the thing you want to do the most in the world? That's not the question that I can answer for anyone. Whatever your gifts are, whatever your passions are, you can apply them. So, you know, if you're somebody who is a really great songwriter, we need inspirational songs. You know, if you're somebody who loves children, 
God knows children need to be taught a better way. And we need a completely different kind of schooling. I mean, I think we all know that, you know, the public school system is essentially, you know, one of the most brutal institutions that's ever been created. We all hated it, and yet children still have to go to it. And every day they're brutalized into conformity. Like, we all know that this is a bad thing. So all of that needs to happen in terms of, you know, if you love children, this is, you know, a way that, you know, create better schools, create free schools, unschooling, all of that, you know, the schooling that's directed by the children's passion and, the, and their love for each other and their love for the planet, all of that better values needs to happen. It's just that, you know, no matter where your passion lies, there's something to be done. So I'm not trying to, you know, take anybody out of this equation because no matter what it is, there's a way to apply it to the emergency that we face. Um, but I would say... Um, there's a bunch of interlocking systems that have really created this monster of destruction. So you have civilization, which is this agricultural way of life, right? So it's based on drawdown. It's based on extractive activities. It's people living in, well, ultimately cities. That's what the word civilization means. But what that actually means on the ground is that they're living in concentrations such that they require the importation of resources. Okay, So they, they, they've used up their own. And that means they have to go out and get food and water and energy from other places. So that's the problem. So you've got this power center that's surrounded by conquered colonies. And that is the pattern of civilization now for 10,000 years. Ultimately, it collapses. And that's always when the topsoil gives out. So it's between 800 and 2,000 years. No civilization lasts longer than that. Um, and, you know, they used to be more like human scale civilization. So Rome could only get so big, right? And the reason was because, um, well, they weren't using fossil fuel yet. So the military supply lines, you know, had to be done with pack animals. Um, they could only get the supplies so far, and the military orders could only be sent so quickly back and forth, back to the power center, back out to the hinterlands. So eventually, you know, it reached its own limit, and then it would collapse, and then the people living inside would scatter back out into what was called wilderness, but it was really just indigenous people living as they always had, um, and so there was some way for it to recover. Um, you know, and, and Rome was also never going to get over the Alps, and it couldn't get across you know vast oceans. They simply didn't have the technology to do that. Well, that's over. The whole thing's gone global, right? Now they've got fossil fuel; they can go everywhere, and they have. So there's nothing left. There's nowhere for us to disperse back into. There's not, you know, there's there's no ecosystem left. In, there's not even family farms left. I mean, at least during the Depression, lots of people could go back to the family farm. They were only one generation removed from actual land. That's over. Less than two percent of the U U.S. population actually lives on a farm. They, the U.S. Labor Department of Labor calls it a statistically insignificant occupation farming because so few people are involved. Anyway, there's nowhere for us to go. Um, so that's the, one of the big problems of civilization. So we need to name it. You know, we need to see what the destruction is. That needs to be faced. So all of that land has to be prepared, and we need to be getting our food from inside those prepared ecological communities. That's a vast amount of work. All right, that's number one. Number two is capitalism. This just fuels the fire. Um, a lot of people name capitalism as the beginning of the problem. It's not. We already had 10,000 years of destruction before capitalism. Entire civilizations had already come and gone. Um, capitalism is, again, an accelerant because this is an economic system that says what's important is the accumulation of wealth. So it takes living creatures and communities, turns them into dead commodities, and then accumulates those into private wealth. I mean, obviously, this is not a plan with the future, right? You can't take a finite planet and turn it into endless dead commodities and still have a living planet, right? So that's true. And we, so we need to face capitalism. We need a completely different economic model. Those models have existed before. I don't think this is actually that hard, right? I mean, up until 1832, there were other models. People say, a lot of historians think 1832 is basically the point past which labor and land are completely commodified. So at that point, the world is capitalist. Um, but up to that point, people had all other different kinds of economic arrangements that, you know, involved very heavily having moral restraints on what people did economically. Even in the Middle Ages, you can read about the guilds, you know, and these were people who were involved in whatever the activity was. So shoemaking or farming or, you know, pick your whatever, you know, weaving, you know, the, the, the spinners and the weavers. And they would sit down in a council and decide, well, what's a fair wage? Everybody needs to survive. What is a fair wage? What's a fair wage for, you know, somebody who's just entering the profession who's essentially an apprentice? Mm -hmm. At what point does that apprentice become a skilled, you know, somebody who might own his or her own shop? What's a fair wage for them to get for a pound of wool, for, you know, a pound of whatever fabric they're making? And everybody would decide this is fair, this is not. This is usury. This is too much. This is exploitation. And they would set a fair price. And then everybody was expected to to agree with that. What is wrong with the system? This seems perfectly reasonable to me. How much do we need? 
What do people need to survive? Let's make a decision as a community. Mm -hmm. I, this to me seems like a very, very rational way to figure out how to get everybody's needs met. And there's some, a great uh, feminist writer, Maria Mies, who's um, German. German. A lot of her work's been translated into English. And she talks about growing up in this sort of small village environment in Germany um, before World War II and how, um, you know, there were people who would grind the grain that the farmers were making. And it was just accepted that there would always be some people who had fallen on hard times or for whatever reason wouldn't be able to pay, you know, the people who own the mill, the millers. And at the end of the day, they would grind it anyway because you can't let people in your community starve. Right. And it was just accepted because if you didn't do that, if you let that whole family starve, nobody would speak to you anymore. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. You know, you would get a knock on the door from, you know, the clergy, from the other leaders of the community. Like, you can't let this family starve. Like, it was just completely unacceptable to the point where it was unthinkable. Yeah. So it was just sort of accepting. You know, 10% of what you do is just going to be because we're human and we take care of each other. You know, you're going to fall on hard times. People are going to make mistakes. Whatever happened, happened. But you can't let people starve who are your neighbors. And again, all this was dismantled by capitalism because, you know, the, the highest, best use of anybody, anything was just profit. And so my point really is that for most of human history, we didn't live with those values. We had all kinds of constraints on our behavior as individuals, as communities. And it was about just making sure everybody was, had, you know, was okay, basically, that you weren't going to let people starve. We could go back to that very simply. This does not seem like a hard sell to me. So capitalism is another one of those. So that I said there were three branches of this, civilization, capitalism, and the third one is patriarchy. Um, and Rianne Eisler talks about the dominator mode model you know, of, of societies, and I think she's exactly right. So you have this model where men are supposed to be better than women and can exploit women and see women as subhuman, and this can be applied anywhere. Once you have that psychological model of othering, um, you know, you can, uh, every militarized culture needs this because you have to have soldiers who are capable of dehumanizing whoever it is they're, they're conquering. Um, you've got certainly racism and all the exploitation there. So white people are better than people of color. The rich are better than the poor. All of that has to be set in place and then it has to be institutionalized. So then, then the violence becomes almost invisible because you've got institutions doing it instead. You know, and one really great example from recent history is how ghettos were created in cities. You have all the soldiers coming home from World War II, and you have the GI Bill. And what the GI Bill said was, white soldiers can get loans to buy their own houses. Black soldiers cannot. And what this meant was all the white families got to own their own houses. And this is a huge step up in the American dream, right? You now own your own house. You've got some security. You can now start putting money away for other things, like your children's education. So it's this whole step up. The first rung on the ladder is really having being able to own your own home and black soldiers were denied that it was very clear this is not paranoia it's in the bill anybody can read it what it meant was white people got left the cities and owned their own houses and black people were left to rot and then they were redlined so all the communities where black people lived the bankers and the real estate agents literally drew red lines around and said we're not going to make loans to these people even if they do own the property we're not going to let them make it any better we're not going to give them money to repair the roof if you need a home loan too bad you're going to live in a slum and so they created slums by doing all of this so this is the invisible violence this is the structural violence and this is no way to let us off the hook we need to always of course think about our privilege think about the ways we may be dishonorable to other people we may have absorbed these terrible messages and that all has to happen. But the real message here is that it's structural, right? There are institutions that control this, that, that give white people all that power and that disempower huge groups of people. And it's the same thing with, you know, men having power over women. Um, and all of this is stuff that we have to look at, we have to examine. What is at the core of this? Why are groups of people othered? Why are they made, you know, into objects for exploitation? Um, so who benefits? Who's being hurt? How are they being hurt? And then where are the linchpins? You know, how do we pull the plug on power? So I think those are the three different um, the three different sort of systems that have all come together to create this really monstrous global, um, you know, kind of devouring monster that you know has really pushed us to the brink of of this sort of environmental catastrophe that we're now facing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't remember what your question was. Well, but. I, I don't either, but I'm, I mean, just I'm loving you just I'm going. Loving, just going uh, I mean, one of the uh, things that's occurring to me is the tragic irony. The tragic irony is that as is James that, Howard Kunstler says. You know, suburbia is the greatest uh, misallocation of human resources in, in history. Um, yeah. It's just, uh, well, I mean, 
one of the the other book that I'm reading right now, in addition to uh, Deep Green Resistance, and uh, The Soil Will Save Us. There's three books I'm reading is uh, Naomi Klein's new book, um, mm -hmm. This Changes Everything. And I'm just sure. absolutely loving this book. I mean, it's just like one of the best books I've read. Um, say a little bit about Deep Green Resistance um, and also your other book, Earth at Risk. I mean, uh, help us understand, because one of the things that you're known for is, uh, you know, resistance to violence against women, resistance to mm -hmm. violence against the earth, the planet, resistance to, uh, against violence to the future. So mm -hmm. speak to that in any way that you want to. So with Deep Green Resistance, we wanted to lay out in very clear terms um, those the institutions that are in fact you know making that destruction happen. So again, we talk about civilization as that that primary wound to the planet. Um, that agriculture cannot be sustained. That any way of life that's based on extractive activities, you know, ultimately is going to hit zero. Right? You can't extract, you know, and you know, these materials are finite. So whether it's metal, whether it's, you know, oil, whether it's coal, eventually, you know, they don't reproduce. So at the end of the day, it's, it's over. And we have certainly treated all these biomes in the same way. You know, civilization treats trees and water and soil as if they can just be extracted forever rather than just taking a sustainable amount because it's based on drawdown. It's based on what's called overshoot, okay? So there's that, and that combines with capitalism, and that combines with patriarchy to make this, you know, really sort of global monstrous system that, you know, is just devouring everything in sight. So we wanted to lay that out in really clear terms. So this is the depth of the problem. This is the scale of the problem. And this is why the solutions that are being offered to us by, you know, the big green um, supposedly ecological environmental organizations, they don't match the scale of the problem. Um, and something very strange happened to the environmental movement. Somewhere in the 1980s, it stopped being about, saving the creatures and the places that we love and it became instead saving this way of life mm. by whatever means necessary so instead of trying to stop the destruction of the planet it's now become well how do we continue to fuel the destruction of the planet in the best way possible so it's flipped from you know, um, prairies and forests and rivers and salmon and grizzly bears and wolves need our love and need our attention and they need us to see them as brothers and sisters because we're all part of this together. Now it's we need to keep extracting all of that, destroying all of that, consuming all of that, but how are we going to fuel it because we can't keep using fossil fuel? So maybe if we just use wind power and solar power, we can continue to have this way of life. And I don't understand what happened to this movement that I loved and was a part of. It has become something unrecognizable to me. And I don't get it. I, I, this is a profound contradiction at the heart of what is now the environmental movement. You can't continue to fuel the destruction and say that you're trying to stop the destruction. You either care about these places and these creatures and you want to stop that or you don't. And like uh, the Occupy move movement, you know, staked that, made that, that great claim about the 1% and the 99%. I mean, it's just a great slogan because it's immediately apparent that that's true. There is 1% that's pretty much getting everything. And the 99%, the rest of us, you know, are in thrall. We are essentially serfs to the 1%. And that's true. And, you know, the, then the division comes. So is your goal, okay, so add to that. 98% of the old growth forests are gone and 99% of the world's prairies are gone. So it's not just 99% of the humans. You know, it's 99% of the planet as well. And so the question is, that last 1% of the planet that's left, is your goal to divide that up equally between the people or is your goal to stop the destruction while there's still something left at all and that's my goal yeah. and it seems to me that a lot of people who claim to be environmentalists their goal is something else it's to take what's left and keep devouring it but just divide it up more equally and I don't see that as a net plus I mean I just don't now we can also get into all the problems with why solar and wind are not going to work they don't scale up and they are ultimately extractive activities themselves I mean you can't make those kinds of high-tech um, you know, the solar panels and the wind turbines and all of that without having things like rare earth mining. And if you go to China where they're doing the rare earth mining, you will find 60 mile long lakes of literally just lakes of poison. And everybody in the area has pancreatic cancer. And when they have said, we don't want this done to our land, um, the environmental activists there are literally tortured by their government for, for trying to stop this. So this is no better than fossil fuel, okay? You have to destroy the land where this is done, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen, seen a mine, but it's 
just hellacious. It looks just like the tar sands, only what you're getting out instead is rare earth metals. Um, this is what you have to have in order to build solar panels and wind turbines. This is what those technologies depend on. And these are just as extractive as fossil fuels. There is no future in this, people. This way of life is over. There was never a future in it. You know, you can't consume at this rate. I mean, the level of energy, the average American, we would each have, if it had to be applied, you know, gotten from humans to consume at this rate, we would each have 200 slaves. Right. That's how much power is involved in the average American's consumption. I mean, up until very recently in human history, only emperors had that kind of power at their disposal. You know, it's, you're not going to, you're not going to fuel this with solar and wind. And the only way to even make those technologies possible is the exact same destruction as fossil fuel. And they're also just, you know, they talk about wanting to turn vast amounts of, of desert and arid ar areas into these great big solar collectors. Those are incredibly fragile ecosystems. You've got animals that are already just on the brink of extinction trying to live their lives there. This is, spells the end of them. I mean, it's just over for the, you know, the prairie grouse and, and the swift fox and these other creatures that, that need a home. You can't just take it over and fill it with solar panels. And then really horrifying things, when birds fly over those panels, their wings fry, fly, fry right off their bodies. I mean, it's just massive destruction. Again, and for what? So that we can continue to consume the planet? I just don't understand it. So ultimately, at the end of the day, I mean, the only way of life that's sustainable is a way of life that's sustainable. It can't be based on extraction. You know, it has to be based on our participation. Um, so yes, what that means is hunter-gatherers are absolutely sustainable. It's This is... They did it for two and a half million years and everything was fine. Um, and then there's other sort of variations on that. So pastoralism, you could say that's a little bit different, but it's basically the same idea. And horticulture, certainly, it's a very similar idea. What those ways of life have in common is that there's a perennial polyculture that remains intact. And then we take our, you know, our food out of, out of that, just mm -hmm. from that. Very different than agriculture, a very separate activity. Agriculture is destroying that biome and then just planting these very few crops for humans. And those are annual monocultures, which is completely the opposite of a perennial polyculture. So that's the difference. So I would say that those three ways of life you know, have proven to be sustainable because they leave that biome intact. Mm -hmm. um, agriculture, no. There's, just, there's no way to do this that doesn't destroy everything because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So um, when I look at the future, that's the future that we've got. And what that also means is that you know, the human population over the next two or three generations you know, it's, 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 it will be reduced one way or the other. And the only two options we've, we've got are this collapse happens and, you know, there's just dramatic amounts of human suffering as well as, you know, other creatures suffering on top of that. And I don't, I mean, we've all had those images in our heads of, you know, Mad Max and Blade Runner and these terrible dystopian kinds of futures. And, you know, it could go there. I mean, it's already gone there in some places around the world. We could also stop it. I mean, there's, there's no biological reason for this to continue. We know where babies come from. I mean, it's not actually a great big mystery. Um, the people who overshoot are the agriculturalists. This is the problem. Because it's based on drawdown, you don't realize that you've overshot your land bases, the carrying capacity of your land base. So the population keeps growing until basically the very last day, and then the whole thing collapses. And that's the pattern of civilization. Um, Hunter-gatherers are very good at keeping their populations in check because if you overshoot even the tiniest bit, you're hungry almost immediately. Yeah. So everyone knows what the ratio is of adults to, to dependent children and how to keep that ratio in check. Um, the other thing about this is that I don't see this as people against the planet. I see this as people with the planet. The number one thing you can do to drop the population in anywhere around the planet is to teach a girl to read. That's the number one thing that reduces the population. And what this means is that if women and girls have even the tiniest bit of power and control over their lives, the population drops naturally. Uh, literally one half of the births every year on this planet weren't either unplanned or unwanted. Half of them. All you have to do is give women some control over their bodies and over their lives. and We could cut the population in half in one generation. That's all that's involved. And if we care about human rights, we should care about this anyway. These are things we should be doing anyway because women and girls count as human. As it turns out, it's the only way we're going to save the planet. And this is why I think if you're an environmentalist, you have to be a feminist. If you're a feminist, you have to be a peace activist. And if you're a peace activist, you have to be an environmentalist. You have to understand these wars aren't happening just because people are mean and evil. It's because we have a way of life that's based on drawdown. 
right? We are the, you know, we are the empire at the center of the conquered colonies and we're extracting those resources because it's based on drawdown. Once you get that this is the material arrangement, that's what has to stop. Then we will have peace. Well, right? you know, it's interesting because also the 1% are able to keep our instincts working against us. I mean, we have instincts for sugar, salts, and fat. We have instincts for sensation, for titillation, for uh, all the things that we're evolutionarily programmed to pay attention to. The one percent are able to appeal to that, and so mm-hmm. our instincts are killing us. They're distracting us. We're addicted, and everything else. Well, you know, the counterbalance is that I think we also have an instinct to love our children. Yes. Yes. So if people can put that first, you know, I think there's nothing like a mother bear, you know, out to protect her her young, and it's the same thing. I mean, I don't even have children, but the children who are in my life, it's just, you know, I would do anything to keep them safe. So that's, you know, and I think another thing that can really inspire people. Well, Naomi Klein, she talks about that in the last chapter. You know, now she has this child and everything takes on. The emergency is just heightened that much more because it's like, oh, my God, my children, what kind of a future have they got? There might not be oxygen in 100 years. Like, that's how bad things are getting. So whatever it is that takes to sort of kick that into gear, people, whatever you love, it is under assault. You know, and that's why we have to fight. Yeah, I keep a picture of my granddaughter by my computer because she is the future calling me to greatness. Yeah. Well, anything you'd like to say on this theme, the, the title of this conversation series is The Future is Calling Us to Greatness. You've already been talking about that, but anything else you want to say on, on that line? You know, we've got two future options available to us, and one is the end of everything. And there's never been, there's never been humans who face that. They certainly have faced plenty of hardships and they may have faced you know genocide the end of their people we've never had to face the end of every living thing and this is what i mean about taking our hearts out of cold storage a lot of people don't have it in them to face what we are up against and i understand that but for those of us who do have whatever that is courage strength sheer stubbornness love i don't know what what is the right word for this but if you have the constitution to do that, you know, I've basically got two pleas. And one is to face the scale of the problem. And the other is to consider what is it going to take to stop the destruction while there's still something left. And I have been faced with a fair amount of moral agony over the last 10 years because I'm someone who wants to believe that all of this can and should be done strictly using nonviolence. Um, and that could, that could happen. I mean, if a million people decided to shut down the oil economy, it could be done tomorrow. Yeah. There's no question we could shut this party down by midnight using human blockades. My problem is I don't see the numbers and we're running out of time. And this has made me had to reexamine um, what's necessary to make nonviolence work and do we have it. And I've, I can't back away from my moral agency because of my moral agony. And I know a lot of people, we are all in this position at this point if we face the scale of the destruction. And I, I don't have any great answers. I don't. I just think we all need to consider whether it's time to step up um, in terms of the resistance that we are capable of and the kinds of resistance activities that may be necessary to save our planet. And I don't save this with any joy. I really don't. It's like I said, it's been tremendous moral agony for me. Um, But I think it's time that we have to at least put that put all the options on the table and see what's possible. I still think this can be done without any harm to humans or other living beings. But I think it's time to think about um, you know, whether it's time for, for, for a more militant response to the destruction of our planet. Because this is every living thing. It's not just us humans. It's everything. You know, it's the future of everything. And this is a really horrifying position to be in. But you know, we didn't make this problem. History has brought us here and now abandoned us. And we have to find our way through this moral wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well... I've got a question that I've been asking all my guests in this series, and it, it, it almost sounds trite in the, con- in the, in the, the context of this conversation. Um, but I'll ask it anyway because it's, it's brought up some pretty um, interesting and uh, unpredictable responses. If you had the opportunity to have a dinner party with any three people in human history or a one-on-one, you know, a, a hike or, you know, over a glass of wine or beer or coffee or whatever. But if you could have a conversation, either all four of you together or one-on-one with any three people in human history, who would those three people be and why would you choose them? Hmm. 
Wow. I would choose... God, there's so many good ones to choose from. <laughs> I know. I think I would choose. I would. Some of them are still alive. Can I choose people yes, who are absolutely, still alive? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so I would choose Gene Sharp, who's still alive, and he's probably the foremost theorist on nonviolent direct action. I mean, he's responsible for revolutions around the world. I would love to talk to him. I would love to have my friend Derek Jensen there, who talks about you know the how civilization is inherently unsustainable and why we need more militant tactics. And then I would maybe choose. I think I would choose Andrea Dworkin, who's one of my feminist heroes, and she died about 10 years ago. I did know her a little bit in real life, so she was an amazing person. But I would want somebody there who also has gone through that, that kind of moral agony about um, you know, somebody who believes so strongly in nonviolence and had to come around to thinking it, it may not work for all of us, that, that we may have to take up more militant tactics, who was very clear about you know, the level of male sadism against women on this planet and just the depths of that horror and what is it going to take to stop that? And in the meantime, you know, every day, you know, the bodies are piling up. So I think those are the three people that I would want to talk together, mostly because I think all three of them understand the depth of the problem. And all three of them grapple very much with um, the moral complexities of violence versus nonviolence and what that means to us, what it means to us as individuals, um, what it might mean to our spirits and our souls to have to consider these things but also the necessity for action that's actually going to be effective. So I think that would be my dinner party. Mm. Wow. And well, I would I'd, cook. I'd like, to be, <laughs> I'd like to be invited. Well, Liara, this has been absolutely amazing. I so appreciate the work you're doing in the world, who you are, what you're committed to, and I, I just really am grateful that you were able to be a part of this series. Any, well, this any is last a, things? This is a great idea. So thank you so much for inviting me. You've got a great lineup of people. I can hardly wait. Thanks. Yeah. I, in fact, I'm, I'm going to be talking to Derek here this week. And uh, okay. I, I interviewed Bill McKibben the other day. He was amazing. I, I, I can't get through to Naomi Klein. She's probably got such a full schedule this yeah. fall anyway. I just, you know, I would love to have her as part of this, but I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to happen. Um, any last things that you'd like to say? This is really the last moment for for us, for our planet. So whatever it is you love, you've got to fight for it. If people want to go more deeply into your work, where would you recommend they go? Uh, my website, and that's easy to find, except that's kind of a joke because you have to know how to spell my name. <laughs> so it's leairkeith.com. So um, if you can't remember my name, uh, you can actually just look up Vegetarian Myth, and I'm the only one who wrote a book called that, so that you will definitely find. It's easier to spell. So That's great. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, um, and I. Uh, the next time that we're anywhere near Northern California, I promise I'll let you know ahead of time because I'd love to meet you okay. in person. Okay, very good. Great, thanks. All right, thanks so much. Yep. Bye -bye. Okay, bye.